Welcome to Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, a podcast dedicated to navigating the way to Christ through the complicated religious landscape of the modern world. Join your host, Father Andrew Stephen Damick, as we explore this landscape in the light of the Orthodox Christian faith. Here's Father Andrew. Beginning in the late 1970s and picking up steam in the 1980s, the Pentecostal variety of emphasis on the Holy Spirit finally made its way into evangelicalism. What marked this third wave of the Holy Spirit is that its adherents wanted the experiences of miraculous power seen in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements, but they did not agree that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a separate, subsequent event after conversion. In other words, they collapsed the traditional holiness teaching of the second blessing back into the conversion experience. Probably the most famous proponent of this theology was John Wimber, who had been a pastor of a church associated with the Calvary Chapel movement, a charismatic evangelical denomination. Wimber's emphasis on faith healing and the Holy Spirit eventually led him out of that denomination and into the newly formed Vineyard Movement whose origins in the mid-1970s included meetings at the home of early Christian rock singer Larry Norman. Wimber was not the founder of the vineyard, but he soon became its leading spokesman. Vineyard churches are especially known for their come-as-you-are atmosphere. I was once told by someone from that movement that pastors wearing blue jeans was almost their uniform. Overt dogma is frowned upon, though the vineyard does have definite beliefs. In most ways, they're essentially like mainstream evangelicals, but for the inclusion of the charismatic gifts. But unlike Pentecostals, they do not regard these gifts as being utterly central to Christian life. One of Wimber's peculiar additions to the practice of faith healing was its democratization. That is, instead of healing being offered only from the hands of church leaders, all believers were invited to practice this gift. He taught this at Fuller Seminary to students as one of the techniques of church growth. Such wondrous signs were necessary for effective evangelism, and Wimber pointed to Mark 16.20, which describes how the apostles' preaching was marked by these miracles. The third wave is thus also referred to as the Signs and Wonders movement. The Vineyard were one of the first evangelical groups to use contemporary Christian music, CCM, in their services, rather than traditional Protestant hymns, a practice which is now the norm for most evangelicals. They also do not expect clergy to attend seminary. Rather, church leaders are drawn from those experienced in the denomination. Alongside the Vineyard Movement and related non-denominational churches is another group that is part of the third wave, the New Apostolic Reformation. The chief theologian in this group is C. Peter Wagner, who's the one who coined the phrase third wave of the Holy Spirit. And Wagner lays stress on the gifts of power that mark Pentecostalism, but he also especially focuses on a restoration of divinely appointed leadership in churches. Thus, there are now new apostles and prophets arising to lead God's people, offices that were restored, he says, in 2001. Wagner quite self-consciously believes that his movement, which he says spans across Pentecostalism and the Charismatic movement, constitutes a true fourth variety of Christianity. While it is common for those within or influenced by Pentecostalism to believe in prophecy and new revelations to believers, it is relatively rarer to hear someone actually claiming to be a prophet or an apostle. In a sense, the New Apostolic Reformation is an attempt to take the more mainstream variety of the charismatic movement making its way into evangelicalism and to bring it even closer to traditional Pentecostalism with its strong emphasis on seeing signs and wonders confirming the message of its preachers. Despite the differences between them in terms of style, in the early 1980s, Wimber and Wagner actually teamed up at Fuller Theological Seminary in California to teach a popular course on church growth in terms of signs and wonders. Wagner helped to define their common goals when he described the third wave. He wrote this. 
I see historically that we're now in the third wave. The first wave of the moving of the Holy Spirit began at the beginning of the century with the Pentecostal movement. The second wave was the charismatic movement, which began in the 50s in the major denominations. Both of those waves continue today. I see the third wave of the 80s as an opening of the straight-line evangelicals and other Christians to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that the Pentecostals and Charismatics have experienced, but without becoming either Charismatic or Pentecostal. I think we are in a new wave of something that now has lasted almost through our whole century. Like the Charismatic movement, the third wave is thus another appropriation of elements of Pentecostalism. But tailored this time for the evangelical context. But unlike Pentecostals or Charismatics, adherents to the third wave are much less likely to give themselves a clearly identifying label. Although those aligned with the new apostolic reformation stand out for their claims of having restored divinely appointed offices of apostle and prophet, most third wave believers blend in well with the broader evangelical movement. They are evangelicals, who practice some of the charismatic gifts, but don't define themselves by them. One of the more curious phenomena of the third wave is an event that began in 1994 at the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church, referred to as the Toronto Blessing. During revival meetings that began in January of that year, believers would fall on the floor. This is called being slain in the spirit shaking and crying, sometimes making animal sounds. The most characteristic feature was holy laughter and uncontrollable laughter that overcame participants. All these things were said to come by the direct action of the Holy Spirit. In 1995, the Vineyard denomination withdrew its affiliation from the church, which since 2010 is known as Catch the Fire Toronto. The Toronto blessing affected other churches and seemed to peak in the late 1990s. Although its visibility and institutional existence flamed out fairly quickly, the lasting influence of the third wave on evangelicalism is significant. The mainstreaming of contemporary Christian music, both in church services and for popular consumption, came through this movement. There is also a style of spiritual life and speaking that is now nearly ubiquitous in evangelicalism. It is common, for instance, to hear average believers say with confidence that God is speaking directly to them. Most mainstream evangelicals are probably relatively unaware of this influence because it has mainly occurred without also including the practice of miraculous charismatic gifts. So now let's talk about the word of faith movement. A theology that developed alongside the charismatic movement in the middle of the 20th century, with some cross-pollination, both with Pentecostals and charismatics, is the word of faith teaching. This movement is also called word faith, faith, the health and wealth gospel, a term which is usually used derogatorily, or the prosperity gospel, although that last label is sometimes used as distinct from the rest, as we will see. This movement is based on the theological idea that the words that believers speak carry power within them. Through the power of positive confession, that's a technical phrase here, specific effects can be expected, especially physical healing and financial success. This movement is, in comparison to the larger Pentecostal and charismatic movements, relatively on the fringes. Yet, it is one of the most visible forms of Christianity in America because of its presence in media. It is also one of the fastest growing sectors of Pentecostalism, especially in the developing world. Many of the indigenous churches in Africa have adopted this theology. Thus, while many Christians may be tempted to write word faith off as a weird and even ridiculous curiosity not worth their attention, It is likely to continue to have growing influence in the religious world, and its followers find it to be a meaningful form of faith that answers their questions and speaks to their deepest longings. The teaching that power comes from believers speaking in faith was expressed most fully by pastor and itinerant preacher Kenneth E. Hagin in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
which is the center of the word faith movement. The region is also home to several well-known teachers in this movement. Kenneth Copeland is based in Fort Worth, Texas. Nearby Dallas was home for a long time to the ministry of Robert Tilton. John Osteen was based in Houston, and his son Joel has found success with a milder form of word faith teaching, inheriting his father's pastorate. More flamboyant word faith teachers include Benny Hinn, Creflo Dollar, and Joyce Meyer, who doesn't use the label but preaches the theology. All of these preachers are known through their television programs and publishing ventures. Hagen did not invent the word faith teaching, although he did develop it. His own teacher was E.W. Kenyon, who is sometimes called the grandfather of the word faith movement. Kenyon spread his teachings through the radio, and he was exposed to the New Thought movement, which gave birth to Christian science in the 1890s. Kenyon started out as a Baptist pastor, but had influence among Pentecostals, often speaking in the 1920s at the evangelistic meetings of popular Pentecostal preacher Amy Semple McPherson. Kenyon's theological contributions to what became the Word Faith Movement are the following. First, human nature is spirit, soul, and body, but is most fundamentally spirit. Second, God created the world by speaking words of faith and does everything else by faith, and we are intended to exercise the same kind of faith. Third, in the fall, human beings took on Satan's nature and forfeited to Satan their divine dominion, making him the legal God of this world. Fourth, Jesus died spiritually as well as physically, taking on Satan's nature and suffering in hell to redeem us, and then he was born again. And finally, by our positive confession with the God kind of faith, we may overcome sickness and poverty. I sourced that from Robert Bowman's The Word Faith Controversy, Understanding the Health and Wealth Gospel. Hagen's primary development of Kenyon's teachings was to bring them deliberately into a Pentecostal frame, with baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as part of the normal Christian life. Hagen and his followers also made believers' identification with God much more explicit, speaking of human beings as gods, little gods, exact duplicates of God, etc. And he did not focus anywhere near as much on material prosperity. There is controversy over the origins of Kenyon's teachings. Are they simply an outgrowth of Pentecostalism? Or are they a reiteration of new thought optimism with its teachings on all true reality being spiritual? Or what about the higher life faith cure traditions from the Keswick movement of the late 19th century, which, as we saw earlier, contributed to the formation of early Pentecostalism? All of these theological currents were swirling around Kenyon, so it should be no surprise that his theology might reflect something from all of it. Although Hagen is, in some sense, the theological bottleneck through which Kenyon's teachings were popularized, he was not the first to latch on to Kenyon's message. In his The Word Faith Controversy, Robert M. Bowman Jr. identifies two prior fathers of the Word Faith movement who developed Kenyon's teachings before Hagen did. In the late 1940s, the Latter Rain movement, not to be confused with the term as used in early Pentecostalism, this movement arose within the Assemblies of God, spurred by a series of revivals beginning in Saskatchewan, Canada. The inspiration for the movement was Franklin Hall's 1946 book, Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer, which taught that miraculous powers, especially of healing, could be granted through long fasts. One disciple supposedly fasted for 83 days. He taught some less popular ideas as well, such as that the Holy Spirit could keep people from exuding body odor, and that man, once redeemed, could achieve weightlessness and fly through outer space. He also taught that man could achieve immortality even before the return of Christ. Most Pentecostals were not on board with these ideas. But the message of miraculous healing, revivals, made possible by prayer and fasting, was persuasive. And one of those associated with him 
was faith healing evangelist William Brannan. The popularization of faith healing in modern Pentecostalism is generally attributed to Branham, as well as Oral Roberts. Branham was influenced not only by Hall, but also by Kenyon, and like him was a Baptist comfortable with Pentecostals. Branham picked up Hall's message of fasting, as well as Kenyon's teachings on positive confession, and set out on healing crusades. He was also a Unitarian theologically, teaching that Jesus was also the Father although he avoided the oneness label. Like Hall, he had some bizarre teachings, such as that the original sin of Eve was having sexual relations with Satan in the form of the serpent, spawning a race of humans descended from that union. He believed that he was a prophet proclaiming the final age of the church. The latter rain movement, having read Hall's book and also attended Branham's revival meetings, became convinced that a new outpouring of the Spirit was occurring and the gift of healing was being restored by God. It largely left off the stranger teachings of both men and remained Trinitarian. Branham's influence on modern Pentecostalism, especially the word faith variant, was significant, although like Charles Parham before him, his legacy has largely been marginalized within the movement because of personal failings. Kenneth Hagin supposedly prophesied Branham's death, attributed to his trying to be a teacher without the anointing to be one. The other major figure in bringing faith healing into the mainstream of Pentecostalism is Oral Roberts. Roberts was raised in a Pentecostal background and established friendly relations with the latter rain movement without actually joining it. He helped to establish the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship which welcomed Branham and other healing evangelists. Robert's primary contribution to word faith, even while he differed from many of its teachings, was by bringing faith healing to the masses through televangelism. He also coined a number of characteristic phrases used by the movement, such as, God is a good God, meaning that God allows only good things for those who have faith. Expect a miracle, a key component of the practice of positive confession, and Seed faith, give expecting something in return. With the influence of the teachings of Kenyon, Branham, and Roberts, it was Kenneth Hagin who brought all these elements together and gave word faith its current shape. Born in 1917, Hagin had been raised a Southern Baptist, but became convinced that speaking in tongues was necessary for Christians when he read 1 Corinthians 14, 18, which includes this, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Hagen was born prematurely with a deformed heart and lived a subdued childhood as a result of this weakness. In 1933, at the age of 15, he was struck by illness and came close to death when his heart stopped beating. He felt himself leap out of his body and said that he began to descend. And he wrote this, And this is from his book, I Went to Hell. The farther down I went, the darker it became and the hotter it became until finally way down beneath me I could see fingers of light playing on the wall of darkness and I came to the bottom of the pit. Out in front of me, beyond the gates or the entrance into hell, I saw giant great orange flames with a white crest. Hagen reports that he had gone to hell. And soon after his arrival, someone pulled him away while a voice spoke that shook everything deeply. And then he found himself back in his body, that he seemed to leap inside his body like a man would slip his foot inside his boot in the morning time. His really delightful way of expressing himself. After speaking with his grandmother, who was at his bedside, His heart stopped a second time and he again went to hell and experienced the same presence of a creature leading him away, the same voice and then the same suction, that's the word he uses, upward, that pulled him back into his body, although not before he had the chance to stand and look at his body. Then he had the same experience a third time, but this time he began to call out for help from God. He returned to his body the third and final time, but this time, He had been born again. He would be bound to his bed another 16 months, and then he was miraculously healed. 
In the process of that final healing, Hagen said that his bedroom lit up with the glory of God, and he again left his body, but this time he ascended. But it was stopped from going all the way when a voice, which he thinks may have been Jesus, said to him, Go back, go back, go back to earth. Your work is not done. During his long time in bed, Hagen began reading through the New Testament and came to Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. In another account, he says that he came to Acts 10.38, which speaks of Jesus' healing with the Spirit resting upon him. Hagen took this to mean that he simply had to accept that God had healed him, even in the face of actual symptoms to the contrary. Until his death in 2003, Hagen said that since that moment in August 1933, he never again had a headache. Although he does say that he has experienced attacks of the devil as pain, which went away when he positively confessed, in the name of Jesus, I do not have a headache. He began to preach faith healing and to associate with Pentecostals who taught him about speaking in tongues. And he began to speak in tongues by simply claiming the gift of baptism in the Spirit like he had his healing. In contrast with the tarrying that Pentecostals usually urged, waiting on God to grant the gift spontaneously. He pastored at Assemblies of God churches from 1939 to 1949. And in 1943, he suddenly experienced the gift to teach, something that happened to him progressively in several stages over his life, each time with a new revelation. And in 1949, he began a career of itinerant preaching. In 1950, God appeared to him again, as Hagen reports, and told him that the claiming approach he had used for healing and for tongues would also work for finances. And he began to preach that prosperity was also God's constant will for believers, in addition to their physical healing. He also said that God told him that Adam was the first God of this world, but that his sin betrayed God, transferring the legal right to this world to Satan. Despite Hagen's claim to receiving his teachings by direct revelation, this was also the year that he began to read Kenyon, who, as we saw above, taught exactly the same thing about Adam's loss of power to Satan. From this, the basic shape of word faith as it now exists was formed. It is always God's will that believers be both physically healthy and materially prosperous. And God has already provided these things. If we lack them, it is because we do not actually believe that God has given them. Or it may be because we have sin blocking the reception of the blessings. So, we must positively confess that we have them. And they will become actualized for us. This model is based on Christ's example of healing and the beneficial power of his atonement. I once asked a friend with a background in the word faith movement about how this works. And he mentioned that he knew someone in the movement with long-term chronic pain. How did he pray to be delivered from the pain? Most Christians would put their prayers in contingent language. Lord, if it is your will, please heal me. Or something like that. But this person would instead pray... Thank you, Lord, that my back has already been healed. And follow with a scriptural citation. God's will to heal readily is shown repeatedly in the Bible, which shows that healing is his will for us. So if you do not truly believe that you already have the healing, then you will not receive it. This is how positive confession works. Jesus has reportedly appeared to Hagen several times, something which Bowman notes seems to be standard fare for word faith preachers. On one of those occasions, he is said to have revealed to Hagen the basic four-step formula for how positive confession is supposed to work, a process that he calls writing your own ticket with God. Number one, say it. Number two, do it. Number three, receive it. And number four, tell it. Thus, a believer can't just say that he has received his blessing, but he also has to get up and live as though he's received it, perhaps even giving immediate evidence of miraculous healing. Then the believer has to receive it, feeling in themselves the experience of the blessing, and then go and proclaim it to the world. Hagen gives the example of the woman healed of the issue of blood 
in Mark 5, 25 through 34, noting how she followed all four steps. Hagen then says that Jesus told him that all these steps could be followed by someone who sought out the infilling of the Holy Spirit, victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, and even casting out demons. He writes all this in his little book, How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. The sending of God's word, his creative act of speaking, is what creates the universe initially. And since we are created in the image of God, we can also speak God's word and thus create reality ourselves. Reality is created by words, and the word of faith participates in God's own creative acts. Words are, in a sense, containers for the power of God. Scriptural promises are claimed when we speak God's words. Faith is therefore a force, a spiritual substance identified from a literal reading of Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. With this kind of faith, the believer is able to make things happen. After all, didn't Jesus say that believers by faith could move mountains? In 1966, Hagen set up his ministry in Tulsa, and eight years later he founded the Rema Bible Training Center. Rema, really Rima in Greek, is a Greek word used in the New Testament for the spoken word. The word here refers to the positive confession of faith in terms of a spoken word. In 1979, together with other televangelists, Hagen founded the International Convention of Faith Churches and Ministers, which functions as a virtual denomination for the word faith movement. Hagen's ministry continues after his death in 2003 with his quasi-denomination, ministry training schools in multiple countries, publications and radio and television broadcasts, now headed by his son, Kenneth W. Hagen. In our time, the word faith movement is mostly visible via the many televangelists who preach its message. Hoal looked to Hagen as Dad Hagen. That's what they called him while he was alive. One development which disturbed Hagen was the growing emphasis on material wealth by the younger generation of leaders like Kenneth Copeland and Creflo Dollar. In 1999, Hagen repeatedly summoned Copeland, Dollar, and others to Tulsa to discuss with them his concerns about their preaching. And a year later, he published a book summarizing his five essential points entitled The Midas Touch. And here are those five points. Number one. Financial prosperity is not by itself a sign of God's blessings. If it were, then rich drug dealers and other criminals are just as blessed as rich prosperity teachers. Hagen wrote, Material wealth can be connected to the blessings of God or it can be totally disconnected from the blessings of God. Certainly, financial prosperity is not an infallible gauge of a person's spirituality. Second point. People should not give to ministries expecting to get greater wealth back from God. As he said, there is no spiritual formula to sow a Ford and reap a Mercedes. Number three, it's wrong for believers to name their seed when giving an offering. That is, they should not be offering up a wish list to God, focusing on what is desired by the believer. This practice apparently had become popular at Word Faith conferences in the 1980s. Fourth, Literalizing a hundredfold return on giving is not biblical. If it were true, as he wrote, we would have Christians walking around with not billions or trillions of dollars, but quadrillions of dollars. Fifth, preachers who claim the ability to give supernatural debt cancellation are false teachers. He writes, there is not one bit of scripture I know about that validates such a practice. I'm afraid it is simply a scheme to raise money for the preacher and ultimately, it can turn out to be dangerous and destructive for all involved. Hagen's warnings have essentially gone unheeded. And from this list of rebukes, we can ascertain a general shape for the work of the prosperity preachers. Such preachers often make sensational claims, such as Creflo Dollar's 2015 call for his followers to give to him to fund a $70 million jet or Leroy Thompson's refrain of money cometh and the ostentatious display of preacher's wealth is taken to be a sign of God's favor. 
You've been listening to Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, hosted by Father Andrew Stephen Damick. Father Andrew is the pastor of St. Paul Antiochian Orthodox Church in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and the author of the books Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, An Introduction to God, and the forthcoming Bearing God, all from Ancient Faith Publishing. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.